Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I hope you have your Bibles, and if you do, turn with me to the sixth chapter of Matthew, and uh, we are going to be picking up in verse number 10, uh, the second message uh, on the Lord's Prayer. Um, the Bible tells us there in that 10th verse, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I've really been thinking about ways um, and have been for a long time about uh, how that the church could uh, really give the proper response to this COVID atmosphere that we have found ourselves in. And I have wanted to encourage the church not to just survive what's going on, but to thrive in the midst of it. Uh, I believe we've done a pretty good job during 2020 in uh, that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to go back and look at the numbers again, but I do believe that we baptized more in 2020 than we did in uh, 2019, uh, but we've become fragmented as a number. Uh, people who watch uh, by home on their computers or on their devices and some that come uh, and we, we're no longer together. So I've been trying to figure out, okay, uh, where do we lead going uh, forward and be stronger really on the other side than what we were before that had ever happened. And uh, I've, I've found out that people today are extremely stressed out. Uh, you know, most people uh, get stressed out over things that they really don't have any control over. Have you ever noticed that about your own life? And uh, you get to the spot that you stress over things that you cannot change and you can't get out from under it and it really creates even more stress because of that. There are two or three things uh, that I watch people get stressed out over. One is uncontrollable uh, circumstances. Um, I, I watch people, they, they, you see road rage? How many of you have ever really witnessed road? You get stuck in traffic on 485 or Independence Boulevard. Can you do anything about that? You get stressed out over something really that uh, you don't have any control over whatsoever. Um, maybe go a little more painful, you get stressed out over a terminal illness or a special needs child, and yet the fact of the matter is you can't do anything about those things as well. I, I see people get stressed out over uncooperative people. You be as nice as you possibly can to somebody else, you treat them as kindly as you know how, and they still remain jerks. Anybody in here have any old relatives that you just can't please? Hey, please don't look at that person beside you. That, that doesn't help me at, at all. Fact of the matter is, they're not going to change. So you may as well go along with it. And then we get stressed out over unexplainable pain. Um, we don't see any rhyme, don't see any reason for something that has uh, come our way. It doesn't seem to have any kind of purpose behind it at all. And it's those kinds of people that go around asking why all of the time or why did this happen or why me uh, in the process of that or why did this happen to me at this time in my life. I wonder if there's anybody that's watching live stream today or maybe sitting in the congregation here this morning that may be facing an uncontrollable situation. You may be um, dealing with uh, a person that is uncooperative or you got some unexplainable pain that you're having to deal with in your life. Um, if you're facing one of those, uh, I, I've got a message Dr. Ron Lynch has preached here on numerous occasions and uh, really the title of his own ministry is Life After Death. Um, but it, it, it's, it's dying to self. And that's what this passage is really all about. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth 
as it is in heaven. In other words, it is a prayer of surrender to the plan, the will, the mind, the heart of God himself over our life. So we yield to him and we die uh, to ourself. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in my life and every day. So I'm looking this morning at this second message. First question that ought to arise in our minds is when you hear the term kingdom of God, what does it really mean uh, and what is it? Well, in order to know what it is, you first of all got to know what it is. First of all, uh, thank God it's not political. It is not national. The kingdom of God is and has nothing to do with government. Jesus said, my kingdom, in, in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, I can tell you, when you read about the kingdom of God, it's a whole lot bigger than political and national. It's a whole lot bigger than government. Um, then Paul says about the kingdom of God that in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 20, he says it's not talk, but it is power. Now, here's what I'm seeing so much of that uh, really is um, nauseating. And it's just people that sit around talking about the kingdom of God and verbalizing and, and, and trying to articulate what uh, some consider to be uh, pleasing unto God in relationship to kingdom of God. And they somehow feel like that because of the discourse that they're in or they get into a debate or a discussion about the things of God that they are involved in the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is not about talk. I'm watching the same thing happen in churches all over the country when they will gather in their holy huddles on Sunday morning and they will talk about the things of God and thinking that they are participating. But according to Scripture, the kingdom of God is not about what we say, but it's about what we do. It's about what we give our lives toward. And, and I'm, 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 I'm just finding more and more that so many churches today are really not engaged in kingdom work because they just sit around and talk about it and they don't do anything about it. Um, it's not natural. It is spiritual. Romans 14 says, it is living right with God and a life of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it, it's really uh, not a material thing. It is a spiritual matter. Now, here's the good thing that I really want to share, you, share with you is it, not only what it, it, the kingdom of God is, where is the kingdom of God? Um, it's wherever Jesus is king. Did you, did you hear it? Shake your head like that if you heard that phrase right there. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is king. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So he says that the kingdom of God is in heaven. The kingdom of God is in the earth. And the kingdom of God is within us as well. Wherever Jesus rules and reigns, then you could identify where the kingdom of God really is. So in essence, it is wherever the will of God is being carried out, that is where the kingdom of God is. If the will of God is being carried out in your family, there's the kingdom of God. If the will of God is being carried out in your career, then the kingdom of God is right there. If the will of God is being carried out at First Baptist Church Indian Trail, then there is the kingdom uh, of God. So why in the world is Jesus then sharing with us that this is the kind of prayer that we need to be praying? I'm going <laughs> to come right back probably to where uh, I started out this morning 
he's telling us to pray this because the will of God is not being carried out very much on the earth. Very little. Um, I, I even hear people talk of when something horrible happens or when something bad happens or uh, when, when something despicable happens. I, I've literally heard people who name the name of Jesus on their life say, well, it happened, so it must be the will of God. No. No. That's not true. God's will is not evil. God's will is not sinfulness. It, God's will is not about people making bad decisions uh, in their life. That's why we pray this. God, I want your will to be done in my life. God, I want your will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven so that we don't become sinful and make bad choices and bad decisions in our life. So you got uncontrollable circumstances. You've got uh, really uncooperative people and you have unexplained people that you are dealing with and you get to the point where you go before God and you say, God, I can't change that. I can't change them and I can't change this. So I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to die to all of this self, all of this stuff, realizing that I can't do anything about it. So God, your will be done. In my life, in my family, in my church, in this world. Now, how do you go about doing that? How do you go about surrendering and dying to self? How do you go about uh, just waving to God and say, hey, God, I'm done with this. I can't handle this anymore. I'm tired of this stress. I'm, trying, I'm tired of trying to fix what I can't fix and what's unfixable. And so, God, I want your will to be done. So how do you go about doing that? Uh, so I've given you the introduction. Now let me give you four things that you need to do to surrender to the will of God because this is a prayer of surrender. Um, first thing you got to do is you got to, are you all ready? You ready? Okay, here we go. First thing you got to do is decide he's in charge and you're not. Decide that God's in charge. Every day, when you wake up in the morning, before you ever get up out of the bed, you ought to declare, God, you're in charge today, not me. Every day, you ought to be praying, thy will be done in my life. Not uh, my will, but yours. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, um, every one of us um, in our life, me included, have things about us that we really don't want to give up. We, we have things about us uh, that we look at passages of Scripture and we come to the conclusion, well, you know, that's for somebody else. That's not for me. That doesn't apply uh, to my life. And I'm just going to ignore that passage because it really doesn't fit into my lifestyle. And so we step back and we start making up our own rules and our own decisions and our own standards rather than the word uh, of God. If you really want to give up the stress and get rid of the stress that you're facing uh, in your life, it is that point that you decide that God is in control and that you give up the control that you have over your life. Listen to Psalm 4610. Jesus says in some of your... Uh, Translations, it says, be still and know that I am God. I rule the nations, I rule the earth. Do, do you know what the word there in, in Hebrew, uh, be still means? It means to let go. Let go, surrender, and know that he is God. Now, what happens normally when things go haywire in our life we decide in our life that we're going to do one of two things. Uh, we, we decide, first of all, that we're going to try harder than we've ever tried before to control the situation because uh, we feel like that we are so insecure or so we are, we're so afraid that we feel like that I've just got to try harder. I, I've got to dig deeper. Uh, and we come to that conclusion, I'm going to make my marriage work 
I'm going to be successful in my career. And we grind our teeth and we clench our fists and we drill down a little bit harder and we just determine that we can make it happen. Or we go to the other extreme and we just, in a moment of despair and hopelessness, we just throw in the towel and we say, I quit and we throw a big old pity party and we swallow all of the pain and then we wallow in it. Now, instead of those two things, instead of saying, I'm going to make this happen, I'm going to make this work, or we're going to throw in the towel. Instead of that, why don't we get to the point that we just ask Jesus what we ought to do here, and, and, and he says back to us, pray and surrender. Let go. And as I said last week, drop it. And know that he's God and decide that he's in control and not you. I wonder how many of you are familiar with uh, AA's uh, prayer of serenity. If I started the prayer, you'd probably all identify with it pretty quick. And we all know the first part of the prayer. Everybody in the room, when I start quoting it, you're going to remember it and you're going to know the first part of it. Grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And the fact of the matter is, most of us know that first part, but that's not the most important part of the prayer. It really has a part B to it that if you don't get part B, part one not gonna mean a whole lot of anything to you. And the prayer goes on to say this, living one day at a time, and by the way, that's the only thing we can do, you can't go back and fix yesterday and you certainly don't have any control over tomorrow. So we live one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, living as Jesus did in this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Well, would you agree with me that the latter part of the prayer is a whole lot more important than the first part of the prayer? And it's simply coming to the place that you decide every day who's in charge of your life, you or God. That's the choice. Let me give you what surrender must be is second by, by the way, before I go on, uh, Romans 8, 6, 4, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And, and that's surrender. Let me give you number two. Determined to be content. Philippians 4, Paul is writing this passage. And Paul makes some incredible statements. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. How many of you would agree with me this morning that there are some things that are happening in our life that the fact of the matter is we cannot change. We don't have any control over them. So how many of you then, because you have some stuff going on in your life that you can't fix, control, or change, you set about to worry about it? Well, how's that working for you? Hmm? Doesn't work, does it? And, and then other people, they fall back into a state of resentment that grows into a life of bitterness and they hang on to that bitterness. Well, that doesn't work either. Many people, uh, when they have those uh, uncontrollable situations and, and people that they uh, can't get along with or pain that they're holding on to, 
uh, wind up uh, feeling guilty or ashamed or have some element of regret that they're facing in their life. And that doesn't work either. And Paul is saying to us in this passage in Philippians 4, I can't fix this and I can't fix that. It's uncontrollable. It's out of my hands. Therefore, I have learned to be content whether I'm up or whether I'm down, whether I'm in or whether I'm out, whether I have a lot of stuff or whether I have nothing. I have learned it is a choice to be content. By the way, um, Paul didn't write this from the Marriott. But, but he wrote it to, chained to a Roman soldier in a cold, damp prison cell, rat infested. He says, I've learned. Uh, that's, that's just really not in my nature because I, I'm one of these fix-it type people. I want to fix everything. Um, and, and I had to learn as I was growing up and as I was maturing in my faith uh, with Christ that there are just some things that I can't fix. There are some uncontrollable situations. There are some unpleasable people. There's some pain that you, you have in your life that you can't do anything about. So you have to get to the point that you make a volitional decision and choice about it. Um, People go around asking why all the time. God, why did this happen to me? Why did it happen at this time? Why, why, why? Can I, may I, I'm not being mean here today, uh, but God doesn't owe us an explanation. He doesn't have to tell me why stuff happens uh, in my life. He's really uh, sending us a lot of tests oftentimes as to whether or not we're going to continue to try to hold on to stuff and to control it or whether or not we're going to test, uh, trust him uh, in the process. Um, by the way, even if he explained it to us, we wouldn't understand it. And even if he explained, to it, he explained it to us and we don't understand it, it still wouldn't take away the pain. It'd be like going to the doctor and you got a pain in your shoulder and you don't know what caused it and you don't know what created it. So you go to the doctor and you say, Doc, I got a pain right here and I really don't know why. And so he gives you an examination and he tells you why you have that pain in your shoulder. Well, you go out the door, $50 lighter, still got the pain, but you know why it is, but it didn't make the pain go away. Hello? Let me just clarify something, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when we're in pain, we don't need God's explanation. We need God's presence. Um, maybe you're in one of those storms of life right now and you've got all kinds of anger that has built up and you're trying to figure out why in the world, God, did you trust these parents to me? Their DNA is horrible. And, I, uh, and you're mad and angry because of who your mom and your daddy were. But the fact of the matter is God trusted you with them, uh, not for them or not for him, but for you so he could fashion you and make you who he wants you to be. Not in your control. Maybe you're angry today because you're single and you don't have a life mate and you don't have anybody to share life with. Maybe you're disappointed in your marriage today. Wasn't long after you said, I do. And you looked at your spouse and you said, I saved myself for this. Maybe you're angry because your kids didn't turn out the way that you thought that they ought to. Or maybe you're angry because the neighbor's grass is greener than yours. But the fact of the matter is, this anger is robbing you of the inner peace that God wants to give you if you would get to the point that you would come to the conclusion, I can't fix this, I can't control this, God, I surrender. Let me give you number three. Well, this is a good one. I had to spend a little time on this one myself. And that is deleting my calendar. Um, 
let me ask you, do your plans get changed a lot? I mean, you, you, you sit down and you figure it all out and you got it all mapped out and then all of a sudden a problem comes on the scene that sabotages what you had laid out for your life. And you think, how inconvenient could this possibly be? How many of you have said things like I say? It's always something. I-A-S. It's always something. I lay out my plans. I got it figured out. And inevitably, every time, something happens. It's kind of like uh, I was sitting at my desk yesterday and I was just reflecting. I told you I spent a little time thinking about this when I, I, I flying, I, I love to fly, I love to travel. And uh, one of the things I don't enjoy though is going over there at the tarmac and sitting in the airplane for a couple of hours in line waiting to take off. And, and, and there's, you know, you, you want to take off and then there's a plane in front of you and you can't take off until that plane gets taken and then he can't take off till that plane get, and he can't take off and so it's just one problem after another stacked up right in front of us well that's just life problems are going to exist and problems are always going to be there that are going to work against and don't cooperate with my plan so what do you have, why do you have problems? We have problems, first of all, because we make bad choices. We make bad choices about what we're going to do with the time that God has allotted to us. We make bad choices about our finances and the money that we have been given and we, 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 we squander it away or we mismanage it and we wind up with bad decisions and maybe we make bad choices about what we eat or how much rest uh, that we get in our bodies. Well, you can't blame God for all that stuff. Did, did you hear what I just said? You can't blame God for those Bad choices. That's what we did. And then we have problems because of old Slewfoot, uh, the old enemy, Satan himself, like a roaring lion going up and down to and fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, we have problems because of this old sinful world that we are living in. Adam made some bad choices that plunged us. Uh, into some horrific situations in this life. We have broken relationships that we, we cannot fix and we cannot mend and we cannot heal. There's weather situations. L listen to the scripture. Lord, whose sin caused this man to be born blind? The man, his sins, or his parents' sins? And Jesus replied, neither sinned. It wasn't anybody's fault. This happened so that the work of God could be displayed in his life. 2021 is here. And if I could say anything to the congregation today, it would be this. The work of God wants to be displayed in your life this year. He wants to manifest himself through you in 2021. We have faced with this pandemic that is man-made. It's created all kinds of problems. And one of the things that I want to encourage First Baptist Church Indian Trail is that we must stick together. We must stick together. We need each other. I was watching a documentary just uh, a couple of weeks ago and it was about this daredevil who was going to go 
climb in the middle of the winter, the second most difficult climb uh, in the world. And uh, one of the things that these mountain climbers do is that they tie on to one another so that if one is going to fall over the cliff, there are those that are there to pull him back up. That is a wonderful analogy of the church we need each other. We've got to stick together during these days more than ever before. So what does the Lord want to do in your life? I believe in 2021, God wants to use you to reach somebody else. Uh, I want to go back now as your pastor, um, as the man that God has chosen to lead during this season in life, uh, I want to ask you to go back and pick up that mantle of who's your one. And I want you to start figuring out who that person is and begin to pray that God would give you opportunities to share your testimony. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need some kind of magic formula, some kind of spiritual exercise that you've got to go through before you're able to tell somebody else about Jesus. Just tell them what Jesus did for you. You already know enough. Figure out who it is in 2021 that God wants to use you to reach and recommit. The second thing I would encourage you to do this year is learn to be a giver and not a taker. God has bestowed so many blessings in our lives. God has given us so much, but he didn't just give it to us to hold on to, to hoard and to wrap our arms around and to cling and to clutch. He entrusted these things to us for the benefit of other people. Learn to be generous. Learn to give. Don't be a taker in 2021 and care about what God cares about. Let, let me give you number four. Depart from control. Surrender means to let God decide what's going to happen tomorrow. I shared with you a moment ago, we live one day at a time. Uh, and just come to the conclusion that says, no matter what happens in 2021, I can't control what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes, much less what's going to happen tomorrow. So just come to the conclusion, God, since I can't control what is going to happen tomorrow, then I'm going to leave the results of tomorrow to you. I'm going to surrender to you. Here's what Proverbs 3 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and listen to this next, and he will direct your path. He will make straight, that's the real terminology, he will make straight the path before you. He will keep you on the right path. Let me, let me say, let, let's all just quit doing what we think is best and just trust in the Lord with all of our heart so that he can make that path straight for us. So how many of you are listening today or watching today or here today? You want less stress in your life and you want more peace. How many of you are there? then come to the conclusion that you've got to surrender your life to the Lord. What areas of your life need to be surrendered to him? Pretend for a minute that your life is like a house. Is your kitchen surrendered to the Lord? Is your living room surrendered to the Lord? Is your bedroom surrendered to the Lord? Is your sex life is that surrendered to the Lord? Is your finances surrendered uh, to, the, to the Lord? Do, do you have relationships that you're trying to control and to hang on to? Or do they need to be surrendered to the Lord? Is there some secret sin that you are harboring and holding on to in your life that needs to be surrendered to the Lord? And there may be some of you here today that have never surrendered anything to the Lord. You need to surrender your life to him and say, Lord, you know, I've tried to control my life all my life and, and, and God, I need today to understand that I've made a mess of it and I still have sin and it separated me from you. And so today I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to lay down my life to you. Are you willing to surrender everything to him? 
By the way, I'd be a mess if I didn't tell you. I'm going to tell you, there's a cost to pay when you surrender your life to the Lord. It's tough. Matter of fact, there's some guidelines and some outlines and there's some demands that God has placed on our life that are stringent if you're going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, if you're not willing to surrender everything to me, then you can't be my disciple. Clear and plain and unmistakable. L listen to Mark 10. Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that, listen, listen, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come, <laughs> eternal life. What, what did you say? He says, if you'll surrender, the return is a hundred times more than what you surrendered. You, you, if you do the math, uh, on that, that's 10,000%. You're not going to find anywhere, anybody who will give you that kind of return on your investment than Jesus. 10,000%. You give it to me, oh, here's the best part. I'll give to you eternal life. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of return? Would you stand with me now and let's just have a moment of prayer. Lord, you taught us in your word to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, there's very little of the will of God being done on this earth. I pray in the name of Jesus that it would begin right here in your house that we would come to the place in our lives that we would realize that we've made a mess of stuff and God every time that we hold on to things every time that we try to control circumstances or people or pain that God we make a mess of it and so God today we're just going to surrender it all to you God there's just some things I can't fix there's some people I can't change there are some questions in life that I will never figure out the answer and solution for. So today I'm going to trust in you with all of my heart. I'm going to lean not to my own understanding. In all of my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you. Because Lord, you know that I want my path to be directed and made clear. Pray that that would be so in your people's lives today as well. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.